from the Sprung Range Front Inn. I'm Jason Spiller, I'm one of the organizers along with James here. And tonight, that you probably have seen, uh, we're going to be doing a talk on low vision from Chris DeMars. Welcome. Thank you. So Chris is a front-end developer and UX architect, uh, originally from Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, now, represent! <laughs> now living with us here in the Mile High City. Uh, and he is a Microsoft MVP, <coughs> Google developer expert in web technologies, and just all around pretty nice guy from what I've seen on yeah. all the channels. So, um, take it away. <laughs> Sweet. Everybody hear me? How many we got? So I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you for bringing me in uh, to Front Range, Front End, for having me here. This is a great space. How many are on Twitter? Raise your hand. If you can, if you can't raise your hand. If you can't raise your hand, can you not? <laughs> okay, sweet. So the official hashtag for this event. We're gonna go with this, FR front end. So, that means if you are tweeting, taking pictures, which I encourage you to do if you're on Twitter, use this hashtag, that way you can keep track if you ever wanna go back and find out what you were tweeting. You can just search this, and we're good to go. I tend to move around a lot, I'm really loud. Um, I cut down on my swearing in talks. <laughs> At least a little bit, so I'm gonna try not to swear. This might be the first talk I've ever given where I've never said a cuss word. We will see how that goes. <laughs> Ask Scott, he knows. He's had plenty of my talks around the world. Uh, so yeah, I usually move around a lot, of, but I'm stuck in this little spot. But that's okay, because i got this area back here I can talk to. I don't want to get in front, because my big ass, you don't want to be blocking me. See, I already swear. <laughs> <laughs> how long was that? Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> Good, clean four minutes. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> So yeah, if you are tweeting, doing the social media thing, FR front end for this event. Uh, also this one as well. I love the developer community. Well, what, what do you mean you love the developer community, Chris? I speak all around the world on accessibility. I speak a lot about accessibility. I speak about CSS. I speak about front end performance. But I mostly speak about accessibility. I gave 17 talks around the world last year. Prior year, I did 22 events around the world, not including any meetups, and most of those are about accessibility. I write, I do podcasts, I host my own podcast. I am not here for me. Okay, I'm here for you, and I'm here for you, and I'm here for you. We got seats, brother. You can sit. Oh well, that's no excuse. <laughs> but I'm here for you. I'm not here for me. I'm not here to stand up here and blow smoke. I'm here to talk about things that matter, things that I feel are important to the developer community so we can move forward as a developer community. This is a safe space. I might crack a joke on you while I'm doing my talk and help you laugh. If you get offended, the door's back there. I think there's one over here. But I want you to crack jokes on me. I want you to laugh with me. I want us to have a good time. And that's what the developer community is to me. So that's why I always include this. So if you're tweeting, also use this hashtag as well, developer community. This is a video, <coughs> excuse me, I always show, hopefully we can see it. Is there any way we can dim the lights a little bit? So I'll give the premise behind this. I always show this video before every single accessibility talk I give. I give a handful of accessibility talks. Whether it's a meetup, or it's a conference, or even if it's a workshop. This video is from Apple. I actually stole this idea from Mr. Scott Davis, sitting up front. He is the reason why I include this in all of my talks. Scott gave a keynote a couple years ago at JazzCon in New Orleans, and it was a keynote on accessibility. Was it a closing or an opening? Uh, opening, yeah. Opening keynote on accessibility, and he showed this video. And it hit me in the fields pretty hard. And I'm like, you know what? I need to include this in every single one of my accessibility talks. So I'm going to play it for you right now. I'm just not a way I see it. Good. You can catch up with friends. You can catch a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus love. And you can start the day grind and early. 
This is a very, very powerful video. Wouldn't you say? There's a reason that I show this video before every single conference talk that I give where I focus on accessibility. This just goes to show you that the web is bigger than we are. The web is bigger than you, and the web is bigger than you, and the web is bigger than you. We have to be cognizant that we aren't designing things for ourselves. We are not shipping these experiences for ourselves. We aren't the users. Technically, we aren't the user. We can be the user. But the user is them out there. The millions of people around the world. They are the users. So I just ask that you just be cognizant of this and, and internalize a little bit and think next time you're building or next time you're shipping or next time you're in a meeting, think to yourself, well, I know there's other users out there that aren't going to be able to do this. We really need to take a step back and think about how we can actually ship an amazing, accessible user experience. Another cool little tip that I'd like to add is uh, little accessibility things here and there. This is from Marcy Sutton. If you're not familiar with Marcy, I suggest you follow her on Twitter. She's amazing. Uh, this is a little project she started called No Mouse Days. So if you ever want to like remove the mouse entirely from your experience on a, in a, on a day, right? You can use this package and you can test how it works with, how your experience works with just a keyboard. Marcy used to work at DQ. DQ is an accessibility company based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, about 45 minutes where I was from in Detroit. Now she is head of learning at Gatsby. Uh, if you, like I said, if you're not following Marcy, definitely follow Marcy. She's amazing. The content she puts out is amazing. The team she has working under her is amazing. I get this question a lot. <coughs> Why? Why do you care so much about accessibility, Chris? And for me, the answer is simple. I don't like using the terms simple in the context of speaking about the web and software. But in this context, it's simple for me. My mom is of the baby boomer generation, right? OK, boomer, you know that little meme that's going around or whatever? <laughs> Anyways, she's, she's a baby boomer, so she's going to be 64 or 65 in May. She wears glasses. She actually has to get to go see the eye doctor soon because she needs an upper prescription. She's back in Detroit, where I'm from. I'm originally from Detroit. So she wears glasses because she has trouble seeing things. I have to talk loud sometimes for her to hear me because she can't hear what I'm saying, even over the phone, even if I'm sitting right next to her on the couch when I go back home and visit. She shakes when she writes. She falls a lot of the times. I can tell her I was speaking at this event and this happened today. I talked to her three or four o'clock, three, two or three o'clock this afternoon. I told her I was speaking at a meetup tonight. She called me back an hour later. She said, what are you doing tonight? I said, Ma, I already told you what I'm doing. I'm speaking at a meetup. So we have a cognitive disability. So right there we have hearing, visual, cognitive, mobility. Because she does have arthritis as well. So that's also very, makes it hard for her to write. She has nervous problems. You know, she also is a two-time cancer survivor, which is fucking amazing to me. But things are hard for her. She still has a flip phone. Her TV gets shut off and she doesn't know how to turn it back on sometimes. She used to use a typewriter. She's never used a computer in her life. Now, knock on wood, she doesn't have any, any type of temporary impairments. So what is a temporary impairment? Broken hand, broken arm, broken finger, right? How many in this audience have a child or have had a newborn and they had to work at their computer at the same time. It's kind of hard to put your child in a bassinet or put them down or lay them down when they're screaming, especially a newborn. So how are you supposed to hold your child 
use a mouse and use a keyboard at the same time. Unless you have like one of those sweet satchel things. <laughs> that, that shit probably doesn't work. See, this no swearing thing is not gonna work for me. <laughs> it's not gonna work. I'm not me if I don't drop some bombs. My mom has four of the five different types of disabilities that we try to target on the web, and there's plenty more. We've all had some type of temporary disability or impairment. I know I have. I suffer from anxiety, depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder. I had back surgery two years ago where I could barely put my socks on. At some point in our life, we are all going to experience something temporary, knock on wood, nothing permanent, but we've been there. You might not think about it, but we've been there. So I do hope after this talk, after you leave this building, you leave this meetup, you can go home and reflect on what your why is. So that way you can start being cognizant in that aspect. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the, the talk title today, which I give this talk a lot, and this is one of my favorite accessibility talks to give. I can't see low vision A11 Y users. My name is Chris, I'm a front end developer. I work at Tuft and Needle. How many know what Tuft and Needle is? How many own a Tuft and Needle mattress? All right, my <laughs> man. If you own a purple, a nectar, a Lisa, or a Casper, we're not friends. <laughs> if you want to be my friend, I do have a nice friends and family discount. <laughs> so, yep, I work at Tuft and Needle. We are the original Bend the Box mattress company, often imitated, never duplicated. We do amazing things. I work 100% remote. Our HQ is in Phoenix. Uh, so yeah, so if you want to learn more about Tough to Needle, I don't know if we're hiring right now, but I can still give you the spiel on what we do and how we roll. Just hit me up. I used to have more slides that like talked about me as a person, just to prove that like I'm a human, right? I bleed just like everybody else does. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like you. Like I said earlier, I'm not here to blow smoke up your ass. I'm here to spread knowledge and, and talk to you like a person. And I got some feedback one time from an event, and the feedback was pretty much like, hey Chris, we don't care about you. We care about you talking. <laughs> and uh, it hit me in the feels kind of hard. <laughs> it hit me in the feels. So I removed all that stuff. I'm like, you know, these people don't give a shit about me. I'm just gonna go with my talk, I don't even care. Like, don't even talk to me. <laughs> but then I got to thinking, I was like, you know what? Fuck that. I, uh, people need to understand that I'm human. So I decided to put all that stuff back in. So a little bit more about me. I'm a Google developer, expert, web technologies, Microsoft MVP, international speaker. I founded a meetup back in Detroit called Vue Detroit. So if you're a Vue developer, you might know about Vue. I did start a meetup back then. I'm not a JavaScript developer either. Like that's not my bread and butter. I don't do JavaScript. A little bit, but not much. But I did found a meetup in Detroit because there was a need for it. Uh, I host a podcast called Tales from the Script. If you don't know about Tales from the Script, follow, listen. And I love tattoos and horror, if you couldn't already tell. <laughs> Uh, this is the podcast. It's a front end focused podcast mixed with a little bit of horror. Uh, you can follow on Twitter, TalesFT Script, the website tftscript.com. You can listen on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts is being wonky, Google Podcast. Uh, I just dropped an episode this week with Gant Laborde. Does anybody know who Gant is? Gant Laborde? You know Gant. Yeah, I actually don't know. I knew you dropped the podcast. I need to listen, I need to learn. Okay, so I just dropped an episode this week with Gant Laborde. I'm dropping an episode next week with Diana Rodriguez. I got a bunch of people lined up for this year, had a bunch of amazing guests last year. So if you've ever been on a podcast, or if you've never been on a podcast, and you want to be on mine, you don't have to sign up and be like the best of the best in the industry. I don't roll that way. If you got something to say, the audience wants to hear it. Hit me up on Twitter. I can't see that. Who has heard this before? I can't see that from anybody. <laughs> Almost everybody in the room, right? I can't see that. But when somebody says I can't see that, what do they mean? Do they mean they really can't see it because of color or maybe some features of disabled? Do they have some type of low vision impairment that would hinder them from observing what's on the screen? And if they do have a low vision impairment, what can we as developers and workers on the web do and help in aiding them have that amazing user experience. What can we do? Well, we're going to answer those questions further down the line. This is from the World Health Organization. 
percentage of people with disabilities. Now, these numbers don't look big, right? 20% of people around the world have a disability. It's not a big number, 20%. Yeah. Thank you. We don't need to worry about those people. That's the 20%, right? <laughs> but think about this for a minute. Put those numbers into whole numbers. Seven billion people around the world, give or take. There's, now this was from a couple of years ago from the World Health Organization. I'm still trying to find updated numbers. They're out there. Give or take a little more than seven billion people around the world, maybe a lot more. 1.4 billion of them have some type of disability. Out of the five that I mentioned, and maybe more that we don't know about, or that we don't really classify in the web context as having disability. So that 20% doesn't look like a small number anymore when it equates to 1.4 billion people. This is one of the reasons why we need to care about accessibility. Speaking of accessibility and the 20%, how many have heard at some point in their career that, oh hey, we're just building our applications internally. None of us have disabilities. <laughs> you know it's against the HIPAA law to ask, right? right? We were just speaking earlier. You're in the medical field as a front end dev. You, you, you know these things, you understand, you understand HIPAA, right? You have to understand that compliance when you're building on the web. Nobody's gonna walk up to be like, yo, what's up, my name's Chris, I have Deuteronomia. <laughs> Holla. You know, but nobody's gonna do that, you know? Every time I've heard that statement come out of somebody's mouth, I have called bullshit. I've worked with developers who are colorblind. I've worked with one developer who is deaf in one ear. And her biggest struggle was video on the web because most people don't have captions or transcripts, right? I've worked with QAs and VAs who are colorblind or might have dyslexia. These people are internal as well. 20% of that, your workforce has some type of disability. So you have to internalize that. So the next time I encourage you, don't do it like me, but I encourage you next time somebody says, oh, we don't have people with disabilities here. You could turn right around and say, well, I do. Or I know somebody that does, right? Internalize that a little bit. Make them think. How many have said this term before? A lived Y, L E, L I. Raise your hand if you if you could raise your hand. <laughs> okay, sweet. Does anybody know what the technical term? Not what this stands for. And this is what always trips people up. This is why people think this is a form of gatekeeping, and it's not. Do you know what this term, like what the technical term means? You've seen this elsewhere in the wild. If you know what it is, shout it out. Scott, you can't. Scott is also an accessibility advocate that speaks from the world. So he, he can't answer any of my questions. I want the non-accessibility people. Shot in the dark, just throw it out there. Are you asking if it means accessibility? No, that, yeah, we know, we, we're gonna get to that, but what does the technical term for this combination of letters and numbers mean? What's it called? You, shh, you don't get to speak here. Because <laughs> you're an accessibility person. Do we know what it's called? It's fine if you don't, we're gonna learn. Cool. It's called a numeronym. What a numeronym is, is you take the first, let me see this. I, don't, I haven't used this one in so long. A friend of mine has my other one. You take the first letter, you take the last letter, you count the letters in between, and you get your numeronym, A11Y. You've seen this before. How many work with internationalization? I18N. That's a numeronym. What about localization? L10N, that's a new one. How many work with Kubernetes? <laughs> K8S. Not look at your shit. I am like, oh, shit! No, <laughs> I know! Wait, what? See? We're learning! I, have no idea. I love it. That's, you know, all I care about is if that one person <laughs> drop in the audience. I don't care about anybody else. I do care about everybody. But that one person's like, fuck. <laughs> then we're good. You've seen this out in the wild. Internationalization, localization, Kubernetes, accessibility. 
So if you ever hear somebody talking about A11Y or Ally or Ally in the context of web and software, not in the context of being a male ally in tech, which I hope all the men in this room are, nine times out of 10, they're talking about accessibility. So what is accessibility? Well, you know, the W3 says this, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. But I have a big problem with what the W3 says. I don't like authority too much. And to me, the W3 is authority. I mean, they put up W3 schools, so hopefully nobody goes there. Does anybody work for W3 yet? Standing members of the W3 working groups or anything? I actually am, so I should probably come up to it. <laughs> no, I don't like the w, like, in all honesty, I don't like what the W3 says. What working group are you in? Accessibility. Okay. That's yeah, I mean, like the silver membership group, working group or something? Yeah, I don't know. But I really, all jokes aside, I don't like what they say here. Web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. So this talk is gonna be a little bit, uh, I'm gonna ask questions and I'm hoping you're very enthusiastic. I know it's later at night, but we're gonna, we're gonna have fun because tomorrow's Friday and the weekend's almost here. <laughs> this is an open web, right? That's crazy, it's an open web. <laughs> and if an open web means an inclusive web, I keep looking down because I don't want to step on anything and trip because there's some wires back here. If an open web means an inclusive web and an, web, an inclusive web means web for all, this sounds a lot better. Web accessibility means that everyone can use the web. Every single person that uses the internet should be able to have an amazing, accessible user experience, regardless of ability or disability. That is the way it is. We are not creating separate experiences for every single type of disability out there. It is impossible, right? We are shipping one experience and one experience only. We have to keep in mind all of these different types of things. Now, what I have seen from other, like there are some websites out there that have these, I guess you would call them accessibility simulators, where a menu will pop up and it'll be just an accessibility menu on the website. And if you have some type of color vision deficiency, you can choose whether you have Deuteranopia, Protonopia, Tridenopia, click it, and it'll change the color scheme of that application for you so you can visually see it. Excuse me, it has options to zoom in or out of the font. It has an option for possibly monochromatic color vision deficiency, which I'll get into. It also has options for dyslexic users to change the typeface and the font style because dyslexic users can read, easily read, more ital italicized type fonts, opposed to straight up and down. Those are amazing. If you can ever bring that up or maybe shoot that as an idea at your organization, it might take some resources, it might take some time. But don't end up like Domino's, that's mm -hmm. all I'm asking. I still don't eat Domino's to this day, even though they're a Michigan company. Because their website might be accessible, but it's not accessible to low vision and blind users. Here's another one from the web aim. The web is not a barrier to people with disabilities. <clears throat> it is the solution. I really, really like this a lot from WebAIM. The key word in here, solution. It is our job as developers, designers, product owners, stakeholders, QA, BA, whatever piece of the pie you have your hand in, in that web experience, it is your moral obligation and job to give a shit. And if you don't, you are in the wrong industry. And that will be a hill I will die on forever. You have to care. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Let's flip that. Let's say we're in surgery. Let's say we're a surgeon. I'm a surgeon. Or, you know, I'm just going to come in and just cut here and do a little bit of this and sew up and I'm going to leave with no afterthought, no aftercare, no pre-prep of what you're doing. You're in there to make incisions and sew some shit up and clock out and collect the check. That is not fair to yourself, that is not fair to your users, it is not fair to the organization, and in the greater scheme of things, it's not fair to the web. That breaks the web for everybody. We are here to come up with solutions. This is a quote from me. Accessibility is not a requirement. It is a must. 
The three things that matter when you're shipping an experience, not in this order, but top three priority, accessibility, performance, security. All three of those things should take top priority over anything. And if you have trouble trying to correlate this to business holders, stakeholders, we can talk about that. I've found ways to get around that and try to make a point. Usually it's telling them they'll get sued and they're like, Shh, don't, don't tell legal. <laughs> don't tell legal that. I don't beat around the bush. I will tell you flat out, you will get a lawsuit. And here are all the evidence to back it up. Target, Domino's, Red Roof Inn. There's a lot of them out there. Winn-Dixie, Bank of America, a lot of places. Bank of America was not protected because they own the world or they own the United States. FinTech does not matter. So if you're in FinTech and you think just because you make billions and trillions of dollars a year, it doesn't protect you from anything. These are laws. These are moral things that we're doing. So when we talk about disability and users with disabilities, we usually talk about five different types of disabilities. And I touched on them a little bit when I was talking about my mom. We have hearing disabilities, like conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, and a mixture of two of those. We have cognitive disabilities, math comprehension, reading comprehension, what else, dyslexia. Those are cognitive types of disabilities. We have mobility disabilities, cerebral palsy, arthritis, MS, my mom has arthritis. Those are Parkinson's disease. These are mobility disabilities, right? It might be really hard for a user to hit a button if they're experiencing tremors, if they're using a mouse. There was just a study that, the, an article that came out the other day about it. Temporary impairments, broken hand, broken arm, broken finger, right? Anxiety, you might have anxiety today, but you might not have it tomorrow if you're using an experience, right? It comes and it goes. I know it does for me. Your mileage may vary. But today we're gonna to talk about vision, and specifically we're gonna talk about low vision. And what, uh, there's tons of different types of low vision disabilities out there. I'm only going to cover a few of them today. How many have heard about this four-letter acronym before, POR? Cool. Well, POR stands for perceivable. So is the experience easily readable? Can I use a screen reader? And I want you to eat, sleep, and breathe POR. These are the four guiding principles when we're building for accessibility on the web. Is it operable? Can I solely just use a keyboard? Are the interactions easy? Are there timers on certain actions? How many have been in this position where you have buying concert tickets on Ticketmaster, or Live, Livewire, or whatever, right? And you got a countdown. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't have my credit card. <laughs> Anxiety, <laughs> boom. I gotta run and get it. Oh, the, the wife or the boyfriend or the partner or the kid's crying, you know, I gotta get these tickets, so I gotta get these tickets. And it's just triggering and triggering and triggering. Timers are not good. Because even if you have, don't have a certain type of disability, anxiety is just, it's an impairment. It is, it is a damn, dis, it is disabling for me. Why would you want to cause grief to your user and have them cause them anxiety? You're not doing anybody anything. You're just causing a disservice. Carousels, right? <laughs> if, if you do use carousels, roll your own. Use CSS. The snap scroll is a thing now, supported. Uh, don't use Owl Carousel. It's shitty. <laughs> Trust me. Don't go to Tough Noodles website and view the source either. <laughs> We're switching all that stuff out. This was back in the day before, like when it was still supported. You, understandable. Do I understand the language? Language plays a big part in accessibility. Not just language as far as cultural language, Spanish, French, stuff like that. The language that you're actually using in the copy. That makes a big difference. Are there supplemental representations for things I don't understand? Like words and associated pictures or logos or, or, or symbols. And then we have robust. And robust meaning can the experience be viewed and used across a wide range of technologies. Screen readers, different assistive technologies. Right? If I don't have my glasses when I sit at the computer, that's an assistive technology. I just, I did a podcast yesterday where we were talking about assistive technologies. And the person I was, I was doing it with, because I, I was guest spotting on it, she was saying, oh, if I don't have my glasses, I cannot use a computer. If I don't have my assistive technology, and I never thought about that, you know? 
you think you hear assistive technology, you think screen reader, sip and puff machine, braille machine, right? Never glasses. But glasses are an assistive technology. Contacts. So out of these four different things, I want you all to just take heed to perceivable. This is what we're going to talk about when we talk about low vision. Low caveat, poor vision does not mean low vision. Poor vision can be corrected. LASIK, context, classes, right? Low vision, there is no correcting it at all. Yeah, there are special, for color vision deficiency people, they do make some glasses where they can see in color, which is, I think is so awesome. It's so cool. If you ever get to see a video on YouTube of somebody that has a color vision deficiency, color blind, and they put on these specialized goggles or glasses, and they get to see the world in color, it'll break your, your heart. It is amazing to see stuff like that. So let's talk about vision abilities and disabilities for a bit. Users with full use of their vision, uh, they can make out things around them. Like, I can make out all of the things around me. I don't have a color vision deficiency. Culturally speaking, but they know the difference between street lights, red, green, and amber, right? They can read text and view images. How many horror fans do we have? What about Edgar Allan Poe? <laughs> Certainly <laughs> Raven. Nothing more. There we go. They can make sense of symbolic imagery and visual cues. And they can also perceive colors. Now, users with visual disabilities on their hand, they might not be able to have that luxury. There are other ways of communication for visually disabled users, one big one being audio format. Usually that can be afforded by the screen readers that are built into the application. So Mac comes with voiceover on all iOS and Mac OS applications. Windows doesn't. Windows has a thing called narrator. It's not that great. If you're on a Windows machine, I would suggest using NVDA. I don't know if there's an equivalent for Linux. Orca. Is, what's that? Orca. Orca? Okay, so Orca would be the equivalent for a Linux machine if, you, if you're a Linux person. But these are things we've got to keep in mind. Sighted users can do all of this. Some users can't. So I came here and you came here. We're all here to talk about low vision and accessibility. So let's dive into the different types of low vision disabilities that we may encounter in our journey as workers on the web and working towards a better, more accessible web. We have color blindness or color vision deficiency, CVD for short. Well, what is it? Well, that's a great question, Chris. What is it? Does that mean I only see in shades of gray? No. It does not mean you just see in shades of gray. Does it mean I have vision like a dog or a deer? No. It's not the way color vision deficiency works. Color vision deficiency is the inability to distinguish certain shades of color. And this comes from the AOA. Now, being colorblind, like I was saying, doesn't mean that you can't see every color. It just means that certain colors are represented, or shades of colors are represented, by another type of color. So it's a replacement that your eye is doing, that your brain sees. Does that make sense? Okay. So, how many people are colorblind around the world? If you had to guess, how many men do you think are colorblind? <laughs> if you had to guess, yeah. One fourth. Say again? One, uh, one fourth. One fourth? I'm well, not good at fractions. Let's do uh, like a ratio. Let's do like so many one and so many. <laughs> do one it. Out of, one out of four. One out of four? Okay. What else? Give me another one. Let's say for men. You say one out of four? One out of eight. One out of eight? What else? You're just dying to say something. <laughs> One in every 12 men have some type of color vision deficiency. One in every 12. Now, let's flip the script. How many women do you think experience color vision deficiency or that are colorblind? <clears throat> One in 60? 50? What else? One in 100. One in 100? You're close, sir. Go higher. One in 250. Lower. 
Why in 200? Why in 200 women experience some type of color vision deficiency? 6% to 94%. Do you know why this is? And this is yeah. backed by statistical factual information. Because women just uh, carry this gene. From who? From parents. No. <laughs> the gene is passed down from the mom. There was a study done in the UK a couple years back. The UK is full of people that are colorblind. People that are colorblind. The reason being is because there's a more male population in the UK. This isn't me saying this is the way it is. I read this, trust me. <laughs> I'm serious, and it blew my mind too. There are more men in the UK, so therefore the country is more colorblind. Uh, but I don't have a color vision deficiency, but if I did, thanks mom, I appreciate it. <laughs> you did me dirty. What types of color vision deficiencies do people experience? So we have a couple of them. Uh, if you have normal vision, this is how you would see things. You would see things in whatever regular color would be to a normal vision person, right? We have deuteranopia. Deuteranopia is a reduced sensitivity to green light and is the most common type of visual color or color vision deficiency. Mostly people, if they are, do have some type of color vision deficiency, they'll probably have deuteranopia. We have chrononopia. Chrononopia is a reduced sensitivity to red light. So these two sort of are almost the same, but not quite. They're still shades and hues off. And then we have monochromatic. Or we have uh, trichonopia, which is a reduced sensitivity to blue light, and it's extremely rare. But we have one very last type of color vision deficiency, and that would be monochromatic. This is the most rare version of color vision deficiency out there. One in 33,000 people experience monochromatic color vision deficiency. So when I was saying it doesn't always mean that you see in shades of gray, to one in every 33,000 it does. People are out there. They exist. So another disability that we have is visual acuity. Well, what is visual acuity? What comes to mind when I say the words visual acuity? And I'm looking for pop culture, movie, fans in here. And I can't be the only nerd in here. I'm a horror movie nerd, but I still know the reference. If I say visual acuity, what comes to mind? I've only ever had one person in the five years I've given this talk, four years I've given this talk, that knew what I was talking about. Out of all the times I've given this into a front of <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of nerds and geeks, nobody knew what I was talking about. Visual acuity. Come on. It's got to ring a bell. Four seconds. <laughs> His visual acuity is based on movement. <laughs> he will lose you if you don't move. Now, this is a different type of visual acuity. This is dinosaur stuff. But I'm talking about this type of visual acuity. This is just a funny thing I try to throw away talk that nobody ever gets. <laughs> Upsets me. <laughs> But, okay, now, now that you've seen this, do we all know what happens when you move in front of a T-Rex? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you end up like Gennaro, and that is not a good look, and it's a shitty way to go out, no pun intended. <laughs> We're not talking about that visual acuity. We're talking about this visual acuity. Has anybody seen this chart before? I'm sure we all have, right? Most of us have glasses. If not, you've gone for a physical at some point in your life. This is a visual acuity distance chart, or what they call a Snellen chart. The Snellen chart is determined to uh, determine the clarity of vision at 20 feet. So if you can read at 20 feet, all the lines, that's how you find out you have 20, 20, 20, 10, 20, 30, etc. How many of you, let me see how to break this. How many of you have 20, 20 vision that you know of? Okay. Okay. Could you prove that you had 20-20 vision if I asked you to? Uh. No. <laughs> Just because you can read a Snellen chart at 20 feet does not mean you have 20-20 vision. 20-20 vision means perfect vision. You can read a Snellen chart, you don't have any type of color vision deficiencies, you don't have any type of focal point visual uh, low vision disabilities, nothing. You have a clean slate with your vision. That is what 20-20 vision means. So 
nine times out of ten, somebody says they have perfect vision, it's 2020, you'd be like, oh, okay. So <laughs> Usually they don't, but they are. We have a couple of different types of visual acuity disabilities out there in the wild. We actually have three of them, and I'm going to cover those. I should have said this before. Uh, I, well, I did say this before. I'm a front-end developer, I'm not an ophthalmologist. I'm not an optometrist. So I'm not going to go into like too much detail on this stuff, but we're going to learn. We have spatial acuity. So what spatial acuity means, it means you can visualize two points in space. Point A to point B. I can visualize the handle on that water cooler all the way from back here, A to B. I have spatial visual acuity, right? So I guess you could sort of equate that to depth perception. If you sort of think about it. Being able to visualize two points in space. Then we have temporal acuity. And what temporal acuity means, it's the ability to distinguish with visual elements in time. The reason I have no Nosferatu up here is because this is a fun fact. Back in the day, when they had black and white motion pictures, were any of us alive back then? I don't think so. Back in the day when there was black and white motion pictures, the film couldn't move fast enough, or it didn't move fast enough, or it did move fast enough, it's one of the three, but the eye couldn't keep up with it. So you would see a flick in the film. That is how movies became known as flicks. <laughs> right? Blew my mind. But being able to distinguish visual elements of time, you watch movies, right? You game? I don't game. How many game? Doesn't matter the console. We're not doing Xbox versus PS, PlayStation, we're not doing that shit. But movies, TV, gaming, if you can visualize all of those things, you have good visual acuity in that area, or temporal. We have spectral acuity. I, like, I really like talking about this one a lot. This is the ability to distinguish wavelength, like types of light, like red light. Perfect examples. Darker. Any photographers? Photography is very different than it used to be. My dad was a photographer, and he had a bunch of old school cameras, and he used to work in a black, dark room. The reason you use red light in a dark room is so you can see the crispness and the clearness of the imagery. That is why they use red light. How many have gone to the movie theater? Have you noticed that the aisles are lit up in red? When you go down the stairs? That is, so when it's dark, you can see where you're going. Do we have any military people in here that have been in the Navy or been on a sub or a ship? No? Well, when shit hits the fan, everything goes red. Why is that? So they can navigate the hall so they don't hit their head or they don't trip on something. This is why the red light is used. Acuity is science. Now I could definitely go down a huge rabbit hole in explanation of acuity, I, but I couldn't tell you the difference between a cone and a rod and how that transfers light to your brain and then what your brain perceives and then what you see. Shit. <laughs> Put this over here. I think I plugged it. I can't tell you all that. But what I can tell you is this is factual things that we do with, deal with on the web. We have another one, contrast sensitivity. Now this is important. So when we talk about contrast sensitivity, what we're talking about is foreground and background, right? How many have been in a situation like this? You drive down the dark road in the city, there's barely any lights, you're driving down a country road, or is there an up north here? In Michigan, up north is up here, right? We have an up north. Y'all have an up north? Okay. So let's say you're, you're driving down the road and there's no lights, just the lights of your vehicle. And you're going, you're cruising, and then out of nowhere, BAM! You almost hit a deer. Or you almost hit a person. What does that mean for your color contrast, and your contrast sensitivity? That could mean that you have bad color contrast sensitivity at night. There are studies shown that women have better color contrast sensitivity at night. I learned this a long time ago when I was training. That's what I've been told, but I stick with that. Like, I suck at driving at night. But I know a lot of great women that are 
Awesome. But seriously, they're, they're, that, I learned that in, in school that depending on the gender, stop. Depending on the gender or anything like that, the color vision contrast can be better or worse, which is amazing if you start doing studies around that. But it could be an indicator that you have trouble seeing color at night. Because if you pull right up on something and you didn't see it, even though you're paying attention, it could be blending in too much. Right? Same thing with the web. If you cannot make out the color in the foreground to the background, there's two issues there. Either A, you might have a color contrast sensitivity issue, or B, the code that will ship, the colors that are being used, are not good enough colors. This is from the Safe Art Law website, Federal Website and Accessibility Lawsuits by State in 2017. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 states, including Puerto Rico. Oh, no, that's not what I want to do. 814 federal website lawsuits in one year. Just from those states in Puerto Rico. That's two and a half lawsuits a day for a year. That is unacceptable. By any stretch of the word, it's unacceptable. Now my question to you is, why do you think that Florida has a high number? And any, I, I, like, I like hearing any answer. Yeah. Beaming blue on white, like a light blue ocean on a white beam for one thing. That's my only, like, yeah. Possibly, I never thought about that. I've never heard of that before. I've never heard that before, but that's good. That's good. That's good context. What else? Demographics. Yeah. Demographics. Go deeper than that. Like retirees. Aging population. I know from being in Michigan, it's cold as shit, Michigan. All the time. Like, we don't have this amazing weather here. It's cold. Negative 44 polar vortex with the wind chill one year. Sucked. When you are of an aging population and you retire, you go to Florida. It's kind of how it is in the northern Midwest. Why do you think New York is so high at 335? Population density. Population density. One, I talk about that all the time. Talk about that all the time. But Chris, California is big. They got a big population, don't they? California is still a younger state, right? There's a lot of open space still in Cali. Laws are different in California. A lot of young people in California still. There's so many people in New York that they live underground. That's the truth. There are so many people in New York. They live underground. What else? Why else do you think New York might be so high? Laws, possibly. A lot of lawyers. Regulations. All of these things can contribute to that. So what is good color, color contrast? What makes good color contrast? Well, it's any color that bounces off of the other. Foreground and background. Black text in a white background, black text on this. This does pass a color audit. Even if you flip the colors. Black on green, green on black. It's easily discernible, easily able to read the content that's being presented. So according to the W3C, the working draft for WCAG 2.1, and WCAG stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. The minimum contrast ratio for an accessible user experience is 4.5 to 1. As for AA, we have three levels, A, AAA, and AA. AAA you'll never hit. It's impossible. <laughs> you'll never hit it. The, the applications that are required to hit AAA, they're more government type, like whitehouse.gov. What is whitehouse I don't want to. <laughs> the White House's website, <laughs> universities, stuff like that, federal institutions, I think by law they have to be AAA. Double A is your goal. You should be hitting double A at all times. A you should be doing, that's Web Development 101 out of the box. You should always hit A. If you're, if you're writing semantic markup, you're gonna hit A. Semantic markup by default is accessible. You wanna strive for double A. So Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 says 4.5 to one. So if I had to ask you, would this pass or fail 
my color contrast audit. Let's see, we got green, it's 1.79 to 1. We got some gray text, 1.5 to 1, 1.51 to 1. Would you say this passes or fails? I hear pass and I hear fail. Fail. Scott. Sorry. <laughs> what do we think? Fail. How many pass? How many say pass? Thumbs up. So now, <laughs> I screwed it up. I get it. I it. <laughs> it fails. Horribly, it fails. We were talking about this earlier. Gray on white. It fails. What about this? We got 9.91 to 1, 19.56 to 1, 12.94 to 1. You think this passes or fails? Thumbs up if it passes. Thumbs down if it fails. It passes. Why does it pass? That is ugly as hell. <laughs> this is how I used to build websites in 96. Black background, lime green, yellow, purple. This is how I did it back in the day, because that was cool. We did the cool things. We shipped cool things that we thought were cool. We didn't care about the users. I could write HTML. And we never had CSS and JavaScript. Not when I started. But it passes, because you already passed that threshold for color contrast in all three levels, A, double A, triple A. We have another type of low vision. This is the last type I'm going to talk about tonight. Field of vision. Has anybody seen two blind brothers before? I've heard of two blind brothers. This might be in the way, but there is a simulator down in the corner. Two blind brothers, and you should have seen this a couple years ago. It wasn't this bad. They make a tire. They make clothing. Brothers. They both have Stark Arts disease which is a macular generation, or macular degeneration of the eye. This is how they see things every single day. And a couple years ago when I used this example, this, this, this simulator down here, and this is also for mobile as well, this simulator, uh, this gets updated the worse their vision gets. So before, it was, it was smaller, it was probably this area here, and that was only two years ago. I updated these slides October last year when I was in Bulgaria giving this talk. And I went to two blind brothers. And now, both brothers' vision is like this. It's not gonna get better. Degeneration means it is going to continue. I have degenerative disc disease. I also had back surgery two, two years ago. I'll be celebrating February 14th, Valentine's Day this year, It'll be two years of my back surgery. But my discs are getting smaller and I'm getting shorter. Their eyesight is gonna be completely gone at some point, entirely. It's not gonna get better. There is no correcting this. That is, a field, that is a visual acuity disability, or field of vision disability. It sucks, but if you do go here, all the proceeds and all the profit they make go to a blind association, which is super rad. So what is field of vision? Well, field of vision is the area that can be seen when the eyes in a fixed position. So, for instance, I can stand here, I can look directly at the rhino, I can look at the rhino's eye, and the vision, without moving my head, as you can see, the eyeball is fixed. The line of sight to the fixation point, let's do right underneath the rhino's, the rhino's neck, that black part right there. Looking up with my eyes, looking down with my eyes, and left and right, peripheral. That is what field of vision is. If you can do all of this, you are on your way to have a 2020. I can't see, but I had eye surgery when I was a baby. I had a, uh, a lazy eye. I had an eye that was turned. They had to pull the eye out of my socket, cut muscles. I know it's very graphic, but they had to do this work for me to have my, for my eye to straighten. I was in special glasses I had to wear, an eye patch. To this day, if I turn my head when I'm shaving, the eye goes blurry because I can't focus enough. So my peripheral is not that great in one side anymore. If you have all of these, then you're on your way to having perfect vision. So we have three different types of vision, field of vision impairments. We have central, like what you saw with two blind brothers, where you can't see anything in the middle, but you can see the outside. So it's almost like the opposite of tunnel vision. If you were to take tunnel vision as a legit, I can only see this much through a tunnel. We have peripherals. This is more or less like tunnel vision, where you can't see the outside, but you can see the inside. 
And as time goes on, this hole is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And we have other, and that's technically what it's called. It's called other, <laughs> where it's kind of spotty. It's all over the place. At some point, there's going to be more of them, and they're going to connect at some point, and they're going to be bigger. They're going to be bigger. But then your user is doing this, you know, trying to outsmart what they have going on within their eye to read your experience. I give a talk on focus styles and accessibility. I talk about this a lot. Because if you don't have focus on your on any elements and your user's tabbing through and they have some type of visual acuity like this, field of vision disability, well, they don't know where they're at in that experience. They don't know if they're in that little slice of that input or a little piece of that button. They don't know they're there because you remove focus. Never remove focus. That's a tangent. Mm. There's tons of information on low vision. Uh, I can tweet this out. Like I said, if you want the slides, get on Twitter. It's the only way I get my slides out. Get on Twitter or hit me up, email me. I can send you the slides. I think they're already out there. Uh, but if you want to know more, just Google accessibility requirements for people with low vision. W3C will come right up, and there is tons of information. Way more than I'm covering tonight at your disposal if you want to learn more about this type of thing. So now that we know there's some type of different, different types of low vision, we can focus on the problem, and it's a big problem. Contrasting colors. I know we're probably over time, but this stuff is super important. So I hope you all want to stay with me just while we get through it. All too many times the wrong colors are being used. And that might come from your design team. That might come from marketing, right? I always say accessibility does not start with your developer. Accessibility starts with design. Marketing. Your designers and your marketing team have to understand color contrast. They have to understand a little bit about the document object model. They have to understand focus and how that works. They have to understand a little bit of user flow. And what in personas also. They have to understand personas, right? And that might funnel down from UX. But this is a big problem, contrasting colors. This is from a energy company back in Michigan. <laughs> uh, this is bad. Once again, the gray on white. It fails double A and it fails triple A. 3.86 to 1. But it'll pass double A at large text. The reason being is because even if the color is light, the bigger you make the font, the easily, more easily readable it is. So, if you were to make a large text, I think large, small text is 14 pixels, large text I think is 18 pixels and above. So if you were to be 18 and above with this color, on this contrast with the white, it will pass. The higher you go, it might pass triple A, but you will pass double A for large text. But anything under 14 to 16 and below, you will fail all day long. This does not work. Sometimes we have colors that just don't work at all, right? Those colors didn't work. That's a contrast issue, but we might be using a bunch of different colors that just, just don't work at all. They clash super hard. Someone needs to go back to the color wheel and learn a little bit of something, something. <laughs> this is a big one. And this is one I, I almost got in trouble for in a company by a legal team because they didn't like what I had to say. Communication through colors. You do not communicate through color by all means. Developers, designers, product owners, stakeholders, we cannot communicate through the use of color. This poses a huge, 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 huge problem. Now, if you're good to differentiate between things, verbiage, use some verbiage, right? Use words. For example, this is my awesome legend. Let's say you have an awesome legend of color, some type of rating system, and it looks like this. Red, green, blue, yellow, and purple. And associated with all of these things, Waiting, pushed, in progress, the value passed. There are applications out there that do this. Mostly in the Microsoft stack. You know, work with Microsoft? <laughs> Microsoft MVP, but it's fine. I can talk shit about them. Now let's say that you have a user that's colorblind or has monochromatic color vision deficiency. Well, hey, Scott, move it to blue. <laughs> What, what's, what's blue? I don't know what blue is. 
We really don't know what blue is. I don't even remember the colors. That quickly, my mind could not comprehend what colors I just had on that screen. I know they were a combination of red, green, blue, red, green, blue, purple, yellow. But where they line up, I don't know. I, I, I'm telling you honestly, I've done this talk before, a handful of times. I still don't remember when I switch slides, what colors go where, not even looking at this screen. Oh, move it to waiting or push, or let's, let's, let's move over and use waiting. And she's like, okay, now that makes sense, right? Associate words with whatever colors that you're using. Do not just use colors. This is another big one I see too. Disabling Zoom. Don't do this. Please do not hijack the user's Zoom. Let's say they need to read something and they can't do this on a mobile device. You just screwed them. Big time. Well, let's say they're looking at certain art, maybe for an art installation or a gallery coming up, and they want to get a little more fine detail before they actually pay the money to go and view it. If you, if they can't do this, what do you, it boggles my mind. Restricting the user to a fixed state of the mobile device and they may not be able to have the full experience is not good. Do not do this. I've seen times where somebody is using bootstrap and they remove the device ratios so it's just fixed to 1280 or 1440 or 960. Even on mobile. Don't do it. Please don't do it. <laughs> this is another one. Poor line height. You would never think in a million years poor line height would be a problem, but it is. This is an example of no line height on these paragraphs. Now think about it for a minute. What if Zoom was disabled? There was no line height, and the color contrast wasn't great. In the top of the off, you wanted to view it on a mobile device. This would be near impossible for your user to experience. It would be near impossible for them to interact and engage with the experience that you are shipping to them. Now let's flip it a little bit. Same three paragraphs, some line height. Clearly, this is better than no line height. Like you should always have line height when you're when you're have, when you have copy, right? But even if zoom if zoom was enabled, the color contrast still might not be that great. This would be possible for a user to read, even if it was gray on white, because you zoom in, the font size isn't getting bigger, the zoom is getting bigger, right? So you're still able to read it. Poor typography is another one. Now, I shouldn't give an example. I shouldn't have to give an example, but I am giving an example. What is the one thing we, what typeface font style do we not want to use on the web? Shout it out. Script? No. Times you run but yes. Times you run no, I'm looking for one font, <laughs> not Papyrus, <laughs> sort of like Papyrus. Comic Sans. Comic Sans. <laughs> there we go. But there's a reason I have an asterisk for this. The reason I have an asterisk, asterisk is because Comic Sans is very easy for a dyslexic user to, to read. Any, like I was saying earlier, any type of italicized or like wavier type font, Roboto, I've heard Roboto is another really good one for dyslexic users. Now I'm not saying go out there and build your experience with all Comic Sans, but this is taking a few steps back. Those simulators I was talking about, they have this built in. So if you can read the experience better using Comic Sans, choose that option and the whole thing turns into Comic Sans. We have conflicting, conflicting typography. This is another big one. Don't start mixing serifs, sans serifs, cursive style fonts, Pyrus, Comic Sans, Georgia, and Impact, Helvetica, Georgia. I could talk about fonts in all day long because I love typography. Do not mix them. Pick one, two, maybe three at the max. But don't, don't mix those because those can get confusing for your user. We have solutions though. We have ways of fixing these things. So we do not fall down an accessibility trap. So our users don't fall down an accessibility trap. Choose readable typography, right? Comic Sans, no, except in those specific cases, right? Arial is a good one for the most part. Icons and symbols, these can add great value to your users, culturally speaking, right? But most icons and symbols, I think, are universal. If that's wrong, 
please let me know. Something like a thumbs up for a good job. Hey, everything's gravy. All good. We're sweet. Thumbs down for, eh, maybe not so good. We might have to think about this. An error for like, hey, something, something's wrong. We need to really figure what's out, figure out what's going on. And then something like this, like, oh shit, uh, everything's on fire. <laughs> we need to do something now because everybody knows what that means, right? Enable Zoom by default. This was an application I worked on at my last company. We did not restrict the Zoom for the user. You could zoom in, you could zoom out, you could pinch zoom on a mobile device, right? This is Chrome on iOS. Do not restrict the zoom. We have a few tools out there. One being Axe, Axe Core. Is anybody familiar with Axe? Cool. So Axe is one of my favorite tools. It's from DQ, which I talked about earlier, not Dairy Queen. <laughs> D-E-Q-U-E, -E, accessibility company, based on, the HQ is based out of Virginia, but they have their office in Ann Arbor. Michigan automated testing uh, for accessibility. It's an engine. You can run it in the browser. They have extensions for Chrome and Firefox. I suggest you definitely install them. I have it for both. My default browser now is Firefox because Firefox is doing amazing things in the UI development space with grid and just amazing things. Chrome is, is getting there. But you can install these browser extensions. You can also install their testing frameworks. Unit testing and end-to-end, -end, you can do it for Cypress. Uh, a buddy of mine, Andy Vanslars, he created the Cypress Axe testing library for Cypress. You can use that. Or if you're doing Jest, I think there's React, Jest, Axe, and you, you can use it with, with Jest, Selenium, Mocha Chai, whatever, whatever you want to do. So I definitely, definitely encourage you to use this. The way this works, this is using Coconut. I don't even know if Coconut is still a thing anymore. Like their beta, it might still be a thing. Don't install Coconut, install Axe Core. From the library, from the extensions, extension link, you can run it on a page by page basis, and it's just directly in the browser. So you, it'll bring up violations, needs review. You can run it again. It'll tell you where the error, what the errors are, how many of them you have. You can inspect the node, and this will pull up the dev tools and show you where the issue is. If you want to see in the UI where the problem is, you hit highlight, and it'll do like a dotted box around it. You can step through the different issues. The learn more link is great. It, oops, it'll take you. Oh, what? <laughs> Jake. All right. It will take you to the learn more link will take you to DQ University. So you can learn about the error itself, what success criteria it needs to match in the web content accessibility guidelines, the impact of the error to your users, all types of information. It'll give you the location down here. It'll also show you the source. So you can start going through those and you can start tackling them. How many use Lighthouse on a daily basis? Oh, Lighthouse is great. Lighthouse is built into Chrome's DevTools under the Audits tab. The new version just released, but what Lighthouse does is it, it's a tool that you can use in the DevTools that can run different audits on your experience. So you can run an SEO audit, search engine optimization, you can run a PWA audit, progressive web apps, performance audit. So if you want to test performance on your experience, and you can also run a best practices audit and an accessibility audit. The accessibility tooling underneath Lighthouse is Xcore. So you got to just make sure things are up to date so you're using the latest version of Xcore, but it runs Xcore in the browser. And the way it works is that it'll run on a page by page basis. It'll give you a score out of 100. The closer you are to green and do 100%, the better you're going to be. But it'll give you a good output. It'll show you the errors that are wrong and where you can fix them, stuff like that. So I definitely encourage you to use Lighthouse and Xcore together. There's other tools out there. Pope.tech used to be Dynalytics. That's a really good one. It runs on the Wave Engine. The Wave Engine is also built into webaim.org, so you can run an accessibility audit there. You can uh, install the Wave extension as well for both Chrome and Firefox. Tenon.io has, has an amazing tool. Web uh, Accessibility Insights. I think Microsoft owns that now. Uh, I think they purchased that from DQ, I think, but I know Microsoft, Microsoft owns that, right? Okay, Web Accessibility Insights, which is a super robust tool. If you want to spend all day doing documentation and checking errors, that's the tool you need. But yeah, I definitely want everybody to use Xcore, use Lighthouse in combination when you're running audits on your experience. And you can also do local host too. 
It doesn't have to just be like a, a regular domain. You can test localhost. There's a way to turn a flag on and off in the, in the tools. So with that being said, I do have some takeaways. Please use colors that work, right? Not colors that you think are dope, right? We've all been there. We all started on the web. We, how many built on Angel Fire? I started on Angel Fire <laughs> in 96, right? CJB.net domains because 11 year old Chris couldn't afford, I didn't have an allowance, right? I couldn't afford a domain. I didn't know what a domain was, how to purchase one or hosting, so I used Angel Fire. So I built cool things that I thought were cool. Nobody saw them, but I thought they were cool. Nobody's going to go to angelfire.com slash blah, 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 slash blah, 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 dot index today, Sumo. <laughs> run websites through a testing and audit tool. If you're in the view space, you can run an access, a testing tool in like ESLint or VS Code, where you can run accessibility checks within that. Or if you're in the React space, there is like a React testing plugin, like React Axe something, something, something tool, and you can install that within like ESLint for VS Code. And definitely use Lighthouse. If you're not too savvy with the dev tools, which marketing -y, business -y people aren't, send them over to web.dev. Web.dev is Lighthouse in the browser. All they gotta do is type in the URL and hit submit. That's it. And they will get the same readings back that, they, that you would in Lighthouse. Choose proper typography. Don't start turning around and doing all these different types of things. Papyrus mixed with Comic Sans, Helvetica Impact Georgia. Let's, we can go on and on and on. Trebuchet. Use a plugin for your editor for testing, like I was saying. Vue makes one. There's one for Vue, there's one for React. There, every, there's, there's a bunch of resources out there for you. And leave Zoom alone. Please just leave Zoom alone. Like, don't hijack it. And if you're using Bootstrap, don't mess with Bootstrap. How many are using Bootstrap? <laughs> How many are using CSS Grid? Foundation. Wow. Nobody uses Foundation or Bootstrap? That is amazing <laughs> to hear that. Cool. Leave Zoom alone. Uh, I do want to end with this. This is a quote from my friend Marcy, who I talked about earlier. Like I said, if you do not follow Marcy on Twitter, do follow her. Look up her conference talks on YouTube. She's spoken all around the world on accessibility. It's a great interview with her on Google uh, just recently. With yeah, I saw that. I also interviewed her for Tales from the Script, too, from a couple years ago. So definitely, I think we talked about um, storytelling on the web, which we didn't talk about accessibility. The next One of the next episodes I'm dropping is with Jen Luker, and we're talking about coding accessible careers. If you don't follow Jen, she's Knit Coding Monkey, like knitting, Knit Coding Monkey on Twitter. She's an amazing developer. She used to work at Formidable with Ken Wheeler and uh, Kyle Shevlin, now she's at Gremlin. But I wanna leave you with this, and Marcy said this. Every little bit of accessibility you contribute is so appreciated and so needed. Take that and leave with that, and think about that when you leave here. All my resources and credits, they're in a gist because there's just way too many to put on the slide. So I'll give everybody a couple seconds if they want to take a picture of that. Uh, I'll give you five seconds. So you gotta be faster than me with a clicker. Five. The anxiety. I know. I, all right, I won't, I won't count you down. Everybody cool? If you want these slides, please come up to me and let me know. I like I said, I think they're already out there. But if not, I will tweak them, put them in the meetup. Uh, that's my time. I'm sure I'm well over, but this was super important, so thank you very much.